Hey everybody, it is October 7th, Sunday at 9.40 at night. We definitely didn't put this one off till the last minute, but I'll just stay up late and edit it. It'll be fine. It's not a big deal. We just, life's busy. Um, so yeah, today we have myself and Chris. That's it. And that's it. That's it. You're just dealing with two assholes. He said it, not me. Yeah. Uh, but that's fine. No, it's cool. We have a, a pretty cool guest lined up next week, uh, Stephanie Sofield, who's a music therapist uh, up in the Philly area. She has some really cool experience, and she's going to talk with us a little bit about music therapy and uh, what that is. Because honestly, I mean, I know a lot of myself included. I just I know what it is, but I don't know what it entails. Um, and I know there's so much more to it than than I know about. But we'll talk about that, and we'll have a little questionnaire about mental health and music, which is a huge, huge thing. Uh, obviously, a lot of musicians have anxiety, depression. Um, yeah, yeah, it'll be a maybe a sad time, but it'll be a good time. We'll all learn something from it, for sure. Cool, well, just to kick it off, it is October 7th, which means if you're doing Sober October with the rest of the cool kids which is no beers for October. You have made it one week. Congratulations. Uh, if you're not hip to Sober October, it's just a fun thing people do to just not drink or do whatever they do in the month of October. Uh, and speaking of, the guy that started it, Joe Rogan, we talked about Hedy Lamar with J uh, James Williams like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I watched Joe Rogan stand up his new one last night, and at the end he starts talking about Hedy Lamar. And I swear to God, I feel like Hedy Lamar is like a ghost that's like following me. She keeps popping up in my life, over and over. <laughs> uh, it's great, man. What are you up to, Chris? What's going on? Uh, a lot. <laughs> Dude, I feel that. I feel like this is the time of year, whether you're in school or you're not in school. Musicians start getting hit. It's musical season. It's orchestra marching gig band season. Contest season. March, yeah, marching band contest. Recitals are starting to kick up. Uh, fall gigs are starting to kick up. Halloween's coming up. If you're if you do any of the Halloween gigs, uh, Pasics. special Pasics, yeah, Pasics around the corner. Everybody's stressing, trying to cram money get to Pasic. Uh, if you are going to Pasic, man, I would highly, highly, highly suggest Airbnb. It is so much cheaper. We, Chris and I, are going together, and it's at, at the minimal, it's fifty dollars cheaper a night. Which, especially for college students, man, that over four nights split even by just two or three ways. I mean, you're saving, you're saving at least a hundred dollars a person, which is you know, that's valuable money, especially if you're living off of scholarships or parents' grants, whatever gigs you can pull up. Man. Well, yeah, if you're going to PASIC, say hey for sure. Uh, so, I have a bunch of Facebook questions from a questionnaire we did a few weeks ago, but I have to rant just for a second. If Facebook doesn't stop sending me these damn so-and-so has gone live or so-and-so has added to their story, I'm just going to install it. I'm getting so sick of it. And it's not oh, that... Like... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I feel like there's like a person or two that I care to see... <laughs> and that's 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 a little shitty to say, maybe. And it's not that, you know, I don't care about your live videos that you obviously want to share. But I need to find a way to, I don't, I, I don't know. There's got to be a better notification system. Like when Josh Jones goes live, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it because it's usually pretty educational. And even at this point, I still learn a lot. Uh, was it Jonathan Oval went live and all of a sudden I was like, oh, look, there's his, here's his Michigan uh, faculty recital. It was awesome. It was intimate. It was great. You know, and there's other ones where I'll have the one that goes live, and it's just somebody on the ground playing with their cat. And <laughs> yeah, it's it's so weird. It's there's got to be a better way. I literally I was I was practicing probably I guess two hours ago, and I had a podcast on in my ears just because I like the background noise. Um, but yeah, it kept my phone kept going off. There was four live notifications. Two of them were music. One was just. I, some high school kid that added me was like running around with his friends and then the other was just uh, I can't remember what the other one was but it's just like what why am I getting all these notifications anyways so a few weeks ago we asked about uh, learning setups specifically like if you're learning a multi 
where you're learning really hard rap like Vignal, uh, Schwantner, uh, Zanakis, anything like that. Uh, talking about your practice space, do you change it up? Or are you one of the people that you get your instrument set up, you have your room, and it just stays like that until you perform it or you're done with the piece? So there's a lot of good answers. I figured I'd share uh, the bulk of them with them with you because they're very they're very brief. Lucas Garner, friend of the show, uh, he was talking about learning vinyal in his undergrad. He said changing instruments was a huge detriment. Uh, because the spacing of the piece is so difficult, going from atoms to Malatek made the bottom hand way more difficult, uh, just because we all know Malatek, the bars are wider in the low end, and having Plus to get the hot touch. rod model. Oh, yeah, the, the hot rod. The hot rod's, <laughs> hot rod's pretty sick. Uh, it goes so fast. It goes so fast, you play so much faster. Um, Lucas said when he was doing Zanakis, he said he had Raybons, uh, Raybon, sorry, set up in a room for a while, and when the room disappeared, my ability to play the piece did as well. Which is funny, but he goes on to say because logistically he did not have the space anymore to set it up in. Which especially at a small school, I feel like that happened all the time, you know. Even here at JMU, I feel like we have a ton of space and a ton of gear. But we're always breaking down, trying to find places for setups. Uh, yeah, it's just it's part of the pain. Uh, Josh, Josh McClellan said with Vignal and Schwatner. He found it advantageous, ooh, good word, to practice on different instruments just because, as percussionists, we don't have the luxury of standardized dimensions. So basically, if you're auditioning for a school or a job, uh, your ability to switch between sizes or shapes, etc., brands, is an important skill set to have. Uh, in addition, he says, I've spent most of my time playing Malatek, Grands, and Roasters, uh, so I've had to develop techniques to assure accuracy and care in the challenging low octave of the instruments. He says, too long, didn't, ra- didn't read, pain is gain. Uh, Dan Crumb said, I go through phases. First, it doesn't matter because I'm so bad anyways. Uh, man, preach, same here. Then it matters a lot because I can only do it one way. Ha, I'm relating to this dude. Uh, next, it matters less again because I can make it happen more or less anywhere. This is a good phase to push myself. And then it starts to matter again because my interpretation is so intimately tied to that setup. Oh, man, I, I feel that the same way. Even like... If you have a drum setup, well, Chris has played from uh, the Scale Masson piece a lot. I feel like that's one of those ones where if the pitches change, like say you're going to tune it up before a recital, you tune it up, all the pitches are changed, and now the muscle memory and the aural memory is like just different. It 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 totally does mess with you, and like I, I don't know, it's I I get into this mindset like I I treat pieces like that in like a a harmonic setting in my mind, which like I've, I do have like the pitches that I like for the piece. And so I can almost sing it in my head. And uh, towards the end of that piece, there's like the, uh, cause you've got the four lines you read at once. You've got the bongos, the octobons, the toms and the kick drum. And when you're layering all four at once at the very end, like when the pitch isn't right, it becomes, uh, maybe it's just because I'm terrible and I'm not good at music, but it becomes massively uncomfortable. And it's the same thing that can be said when I set that up and, uh, if my like if like the spacing between each tom and each drum isn't like exactly the way I want it, um, I know a lot of people would play that piece where they uh, they uh, you have to play on the rim of one of the the toms and the octobonds and some people use like a like a, a metal shaft or something like that for one of their mounts just to get that out and I I, I found I just did it the way uh, Gene Kashinsky had done it with just playing the uh, xylo mallet on the rim and so once that little that that drum moves off like off center by like a centimeter. Like, it just becomes the most infuriating thing. And I've been removed physically from buildings a couple of times uh, <laughs> just for the, the safety of myself and everyone around me. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I feel that. Even, yeah, I'm doing Raybon's V right now. And it's like every time, because we have a couple of people doing it, there's three of us doing uh, different sets of Raybon's. One, an undergrad's doing A, uh, I'm doing B, and a master's student here, Adam, will be doing A and B next semester uh, for his final master's recital. But obviously, we're sharing this setup, so every day it shifts a little bit. And at first, uh, I learned basically all the notes, at least, over the summer, and it was um, it was all good. And then we started sharing the setup, and then it was just like, okay. And then we started tuning things a little differently, and then it's just always adjusting. Uh, on Instagram, uh, Mel's, which is actually Emilio, our buddy Emilio Monreal, 
Uh, he says, I try to keep my practice space mentally consistent. I like that. However, the physical space usually changes as depending on variables, i.e. sign-up sheets, work, weather, clothes, shoes, availability of instruments, health, etc. Uh, hidden stuff. Sorry, I, di I didn't catch everyone's names, but he said, um, I definitely have changes. Changes from day-to-day -day practice times, what instrument I'm on, what I'm wearing, casual versus dressed up, my energy level, even if I have other people practicing around me or if I'm in silence. I think the changing factors leads you to being prepared for anything that may happen. Uh, Keech Pobler, which is Taylor McManaway, a buddy from undergrad of Chris and I's. Uh, <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> yes, great name. Keech Pobler. Uh, he said, I kept my Raybon set up in the same room for about three months. Kind of drove me nuts. I feel that. The change of scenery helps me focus on things I didn't in another room. Just a mental thing, probably. Uh, Nick Hall of Hall's Music Pub, he says, now that I'm out of school, uh, I feel this one, we probably both do. Now that I'm out of school, my space stays pretty consistent because it's my own studio space. That being said, while I was in school, I constantly moved rooms and instruments. At first, I didn't like it, but now, I, uh, over time, I welcomed the change of space and gear, and I became much more versatile. Uh, Paul Millette says, I tried my best to keep my space uh, inconsistent, sometimes practicing in a practice room, sometimes a big one, etc., sometimes a chamber hall. I found that the more variety I maintain in my space, the more comfortable I feel in performing in a different venue. When I'm practicing keyboards, I try to keep, uh, sorry, I try my best to vary the model of instruments I'm playing on. Uh, Matt Lau, he had a lot of input and he shared this post and got a whole lot of input as well. He said, I kind of went, uh, I kind of kept my room consistent, especially for big pieces. Uh, and he's talking about, you know, the Zyklus, um, those, you know, those take up the whole room, not just a practice room, but take up like a chunk of like a band room. Um, those pieces, even though it's my own room and nobody will miss up anything, I spike everything, measure it out certain distances and take pictures as needed. So, yeah. yes, the question of uh, will you see in the real world might be difficult. Like when you show up to do a new recital at school with new instruments, but I try to think that if you try your best to eliminate as many unfamiliar or foreign elements as you can, you have an easier time to execute those pieces. Yeah, I feel like Matt's word carries a lot of weight because he does that very well. Oh, he does. Um, yeah. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Gutierrez, sorry, it's all crime together. I can't tell uh, where the word stops. Says if it's easy to move, then I like to practice in different rooms. Michael plays drums, says different rooms, builds fluidity. Will Bradle says, for heavy marimba rep, I like a variety of setups. Uh, Matt Lau responds and he says, yeah, I agree. I spike everything, even though if I have access to the room, I want to know exactly where this stuff is. Uh, and then they kind of they go back and forth. But then E. Mage Magazine says, smiley face, sun, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, laughing face, smile, cheek, rosy, smile, cheek, rosy. Uh, that's really what it's all about. That's too. really what it's all about. So if you click on E Mage magazine, it's just like wiener pics and dudes and speedos. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. People add I, a tacit thoughts Instagram page all the time. I'm just like, what? I, yeah, I love those random posts you get. It was a couple of weeks ago. I made a post about like uh, just kind of opening up about like the the like the kind of mental exhaustion and struggling with going from like having a million things to do. Uh, to where all of a sudden there's that one drop off point where you have that time where there's nothing and it's magical, but then it becomes maddening. And so I kind of open up as like, you know, I've been struggling lately with getting reconnected to playing and not feeling like depression. And uh, <laughs> I can't, the only comment on it was from some random like model page that had like the crying emoji, like a thousand of hearts. And it was just like, love this post. Great photo. Please follow. And I was just like, <laughs> Oh okay. man, the spam is is uh, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think we all kind of agree that variety is good, especially for keyboards. Oh man, yeah, if you can get it, uh, if you can. I'm kind of oh, man. I really like the look of having all the same keyboards at a school, but also I feel like it's good undergrad prep to have a Majestic and Adams, you know, Malatek, Yamaha, so on and so forth. Remember one with all that money. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of money. Uh, I, we, I could, we actually just okay. got a, uh, we got the new reflection marimba here at JMU, and it is sweet. It is cool. I I got to play on that with Shi e Wu at uh, the Mile High Drum Festival, and I, I 
I can't, I, again, I can't say anything to sound because I haven't heard it from like an audience perspective yet because I was on stage, but, uh, it, it felt good. That was, it was a weird, I don't, I don't know how to say that. Like it just, like, I know it's not like different Rosewood, but for some reason, everything, like I just, the looking at the instrument, I really kind of enjoyed like, so because my first time playing on it, I, I, I think it was like, I'm usually kind of panicked by that because again, I'm one of those people where anything changes and I have like a, I have a fit on the inside and panic and break down and you know, everything, everything goes, everything goes to shit real quick. But, uh, that I did really enjoy that one. I don't know. I can't, I can't put my finger on what it is. I want to play it some more. I also want to hear it though. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's definitely sleek. It's like the yeah. the coolest looking board that's out there right now. Well, I, I got a chance to see like the teardown of it and that's what really got to me. I was just like, man, that's, that's wonderful. It's so easy to move and easy to kind of take apart and like it fits just straight through the door, which was magical. Yeah, that's that's cool. It's so it's just so much less bulk. Yeah, Majestic, if you're listening, just they're not. Just send hey, somebody somebody get on Majestic. Tell them to, to listen up. Just send tacit thought. We only need like fifty grand. If you give us like fifty grand, we'll just, you know. We will spam your product everywhere. <laughs> No, we'll we'll create a bunch of those fake Instagram accounts and send crying emojis to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's really funny to talk about uh, practice space and setup. And the biggest thing is there's a great book I reference all the time. It's by John Gorey called Performing in the Zone. Uh, so if you don't know, John Gorey's a New Zealand-born trumpeter. He's now based in Norway. Uh, he has a really really good article on focal dystonia. After he got that uh, condition in 2005, which is a condition wind players can get uh, in their embouchure. But he wrote this book, Performing in the Zone, in 2009. But it's a book on performance psychology. And the premise is based around a term Gory defines as performance arousal. Uh, a lot of times people call it performance anxiety or uh, there's many words that people call it. Performance anxiety seems to be the most uh, common one we see in America, at least. But it's basically this manifests in a positive, sorry, this can manifest in a positive energy or a negative energy where it comes out as anxiety. So instead of trying to remove anxiety, Gory aims to basically kind of control it. So the idea with multiple percussion setups and keyboards of different size is, say your learning styles are VAK, if you haven't heard this, is visual. You have your visual input, your aural input, the A, and kinesthetic. So we're all a little bit of a mix of both. Uh, percussion will tend to be more kinesthetic, obviously. Um, but basically, say you have, you're doing, ray, let's just say ray bonds. You're doing ray bonds at a recital, and you're going to be doing it um, at four schools across America. The best way to prep after you learn the piece would be to constantly change instruments and constantly change performance space, because then you're strengthening your visual and your aural uh, pathways. So the kinesthetic thing is easy. Like you know where your hands are supposed to go, but playing on a variety of different pitches, basically the idea you play uh, more, or sorry, you play different drums, you get different pitch sets, and then eventually you don't hear the pitches as uh, a very anchored way anymore, if that makes sense. And then the visual thing is you play with different size drums, uh, different looking drums, different backgrounds, different auditoriums, performance space, wherever you're at, and you just get used to not being used to something is the idea. Um, but yeah, it's a really good book. I'll probably reference it sometime in the future again. I have a whole thing about it. But funny enough, um, one of his buddies, if you've ever heard of Tim Galloway, he wrote The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, it also got evolved by Robbie Green into The Inner Game of Music. Um, honestly, the inner game of music is the worst out of all of them because they just basically take all the verbs and they just change it to music speak. And anything that said tennis is now instruments and anything that said sport is now music is kind of, uh, it's just not a very good interpretation. Uh, inner game of tennis is way better. The best one though is his second book, the inner game of golf. Because he was already a tennis player, but he wrote the golf book as he was learning golf and right after he finished learning the basics of golf. So it's these ideas he took from his first book and they're basically reconstructed 
into a way um, for his second book. So it'd basically be if I wrote a book on how to learn music, and then I went back and said, I'm going to learn clarinet. And then I started writing a book from my learnings of clarinet, if that, if that makes sense. It's probably not a very good analogy. But it's, um, it's really good. They both talk a lot about visualizing and changing up um, your space, your performance space, be it sports or music. Uh, have you read those, Chris? I've, I've read the inner game of music and inner game of tennis. I haven't read the other two you're talking about. I yeah. can I can say, like, I mean, I think we've all experienced this in some way, the importance, uh, whether it was beforehand or afterwards, the of, like, changing that rehearsal space. Like, uh, I think the, the hardest hindsight that I ever had with that was, uh, we've talked about it before, but I did the, uh, for the Aries Composers Festival, we premiered Send and Receive, a percussion concerto, uh, uh, by David Reeves, which was, it's awesome. It's a, it's a really fun, challenging piece uh, that's got like a great mix of like concert multi-percussion with that kind of indoor percussive writing styles that uh, David has done a lot of. And uh, uh, the setup was massive. It was, it was huge. It's fun, but I had, I think it was like seven or eight cymbals. You have a set of bongos. You have like four or five toms a snare drum and a field drum you have like a bass drum set in the middle then you also have like hi hats and a triangle and uh, a couple other I mean, it was just it was big and i remember the setup just to get it right would take me at least 30 minutes um and unfortunately doing it at a university where like all of that gear naturally had to be used amongst other percussion ensembles other solos the wind symphonies and like the orchestras so like my setup never stayed um <clears throat> But I, 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 only re- I, I only ever rehearsed it in two spaces, and I never thought about it. I rehearsed it in the practice room that could actually hold all that. And then I re- re- uh, rehearsed it in the rehearsal hall where we did ensemble rehearsals. Um, and so I remember we did the dress rehearsal on the concert stage, which our concert hall is gorgeous, but it's notorious for percussion, just like most concert halls, because it's, it's live. It is, it's really live, and like anything drums just explodes in there. And so I had this giant setup, and we get in there, and all of a sudden, I couldn't play quiet enough, and uh, I was having like a miniature panic attack because David was in the audience as well as all these other composers for this festival, and it just a like a full concert hall. And I'm sitting there now with like I was playing with like normal like concert sticks, and now I'm playing with like uh, pretty much toothpicks, uh, muting everything, changing all my like tunings, and like panicking, going, I can't, I can't. Everything I do here is covering up the entire ensemble. The director's not happy. The composer's not happy. And the concert, <laughs> I, 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 I was found wanting at the end. <laughs> I remember that feeling of going, why did I never set this up in the concert hall? Why did I never have anybody come in and listen and go, holy shit, dude, that's way too loud. <laughs> and, uh, but, like, uh, it's not only just, like, I think we talk about just getting comfortable and playing these different zones, but there's just the actual natural need to play in different environments just so you know how to adjust and adapt uh, because our practice room was super dead. It's a practice room. There's sound dampening everywhere. Rehearsal hall was fit for like a great rehearsal. The concert hall was all open and none of the muffle, like we used all the muffling in the world we could with curtains and everything and doors like to get at, as quiet as possible. And it was a miserable experience. Loved the piece. Composer was wonderful. But I remember like just coming off that stage going, ah, God, I should have thought, like, I should have had foresight for this. That was, I could have done so much better. And then I think some, I, I can't remember, I think somebody played it with, like, the Seattle Symphony or somebody, like, a few months later and probably did way better, I hope. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I had the same thing. Uh, yesterday, man, it feels like forever ago. It's just such a painful process. But yesterday we had a Pops concert. They have a family weekend here every year where... Uh, the freshman families, or I guess any undergrad family members come, they can hang out, um, they go to the game, and then they have this music pops concert afterwards. I was playing drum set uh, with the cho- uh, the cho- uh, chorus. Oh my gosh, can't get the words out. I was playing drum set with the chorus. I used this new, um, I, over the summer I got this Pearl Midtown kit, just for jazz gigs and little things here and there. It's a 16 inch kick, and I had a 13 inch snare, and a 13-inch hi-hat, and I had a 17-inch thin Zildjian fast crash for my ride cymbal slash crash cymbal. 
and I had my 13 inch snare with moon gel and a towel on it and I was still just getting the hand and I was just like oh my gosh like I can't even I mean I was playing like mezzo piano too I was just barely tapping everything and they're just like all right that's the perfect volume I'm just like what i I mean, it was, it's a lot of fun, and it wasn't like anybody's fault. It was just like, okay, we're in a basically a basketball stadium. I'm trying to play drum set. I'm mic'd, and I'm next to a choir of, I don't know, 30-ish people, 30, 40 people. And then they have mics on them. So if I play too loud or there's too much cymbals, it'll bleed into their mics. But if I don't play loud enough, like, I sound bad. And it was, man, it was a Dude, struggle. That's- Play, playing drum set in like an orchestral or just a concert setting like that is such such a weird monster. I remember wanting to die every time we played with the Northeast Texas Symphony. Those uh, super oh, patriotic yeah. like 4th of July concerts and I kept getting those drum set parts for a while too. And uh, I, first of all, I, like no matter how well you played in time, you were never in time. Uh, I don't know why that was a thing. But like I did, a, I've done a lot of percussion with con- uh, choir um, at undergrad because I got them to do uh, Kaczynski's Concerto for Member and Choir with me uh, for my recital and so I sold my soul to them for like two years uh, playing all their percussion needs and I've done stuff like that in Dallas playing with the Turtle Creek Chorale which is like that's actually awesome it's like a 200 yeah. plus men's chorus it's cool um, and then uh, even stuff up here and I will say the only time outside of just pure enjoyment and fun for yourself that an electronic drum set is wonderful is in those settings Uh, because as much as i would rather play on an acoustic kit playing like the like the uh, like just choirs and stuff like that you you put on that electric drum set and it's either the board or you you just turn that volume right where they want it and it's it's perfect every time that's what i want safety stress yeah we had one for the school and it was it was it was great. Yeah, <laughs> won't man. spend the money on it though, because I don't have it. I don't have that money stuff. Good thing we're getting endorsements left and right for this podcast. Just people lining up. So if you're if you're a company or individual and want to sponsor, you better you better jump in now, because you know there's people lining up out the door. I had to hire a secretary. His name's Brian. Uh, he hangs out. He takes all my calls. So, yeah. So jump in now. Invest now. It's gonna be good. Particularly looking for that wing stop endorsement. Yeah, if you're if you're a wing company, we're open. Just, yeah, we're just we're open. Just hop on in it, man. So uh, I've talked about this once um, on the App Percussion podcast, but I think this might be the coolest research that I've come across when it comes to creative space. Uh, but there's a research that they did. Her name is Professor Juliet Zhu. She's professor of marketing at Chang Kong Graduate School of Business, which is the leading business school in China. Juliet and her colleague Jan Eiman were recently named, I think this was two or three years ago, they were recently named China, China Social Responsibilities Persons of the Year and China Philanthropist of the Year for um, Professor Zhu. So they came up with this article and this research on how the environment impacts creative thinking. So Zhu and her team research productivity and focus in regards to people's creative process, which included everyone from business people to artists, writers, even chefs, just a little bit of everyone. Their thesis was to prove that your work environment is a major impacting variable in your work. So her team concluded that the factors that influence productivity and creativity and fail... Oh, sorry. The influence productivity and creativity are fairly equal and they were able to see these into five environmental categories which they said were sound, color, temperature, lighting, and physical space. So I'll just go through a little bit. I've kind of condensed it down. But for sound they found that, and I found this myself, noise is not bad and in fact it increases your productivity and creativity. They found a moderate level of noise around 70 to 80 decibels is the prime amount of volume for productivity. So 70 to 80 decibels is somewhere between the volume of a casual coffee shop, not a packed one, but you know just handfuls of people here and there just working or chatting, very background noise. Or if you're at home with your window open, it's kind of the sound of light traffic and wind going by. 
For the testing grounds, they gave the participants several creative tasks to, to accomplish. Uh, it was such as being given three to four words and being asked to come up with a word that fit that category. So an example would be they give them the word 16, heart, and chocolate. And the majority answer was the word sweet, because the word sweetheart, kind of sweet 16, sweetheart, sweet and chocolate. People placed in a moderate noise condition over, were over 20% more efficient in their answers, both in speed and quality. And Zhu theorizes that this is due to being that when you're 100% focused on the task, you're so narrow-minded that you aren't able to think outside your box. Uh, I mentioned Galloway already, but he has this concept of self one and self two in his inner game books. It is essentially the same thing. You need a mild distraction that occupies your inner monologue or your self one and allows your personal self two voice to work more freely. It's very similar to when you read a page in a book and then realize you haven't actually read anything. You haven't absorbed any information, so you have to go back and read it again, uh, especially if it's a subject you're not so interested in. If you have a bit of background noise going on, you're way more likely to absorb the information and retain it. And based on this research, someone came up with a website called Coffitivity, which is C-O-F-F-I-T-I-V-I-T-Y, like coffee and creativity or productivity at the same time. And it simulates various background noises such as rain, coffee shop, traffic, etc. You can download it. At, it's, it's an app. It's also just a standalone website. Um, I use it as well as um, there's rainy mood is another one that is just rain uh, I like to I don't like to work in coffee shops I don't know I feel weird having people watch me ride or type or anything so at home I use it uh, their second category color uh, so this comes from Dr. Jamie Madigan the author of the hit book mind games research that there's a glaring discrepancy that in some people find red and blue colors in the background helpful to focus but only in certain instances so say you have a red set background or your home office is red. Uh, red is more helpful when the task at hand is detail and accuracy oriented. So your accountants, scientists, music theory, homework doers, etc. would probably benefit from having a red tint in their background, while blue is much better suited for tasks such as creative writing, composition, uh, things of that nature. Things where you're generating original knowledge, not trying to analyze uh, previous knowledge. So Zhu tested this by showing multiple black and white photographs of contemporary architecture designs to professionals. With the nearest success rate of 100%, designs made inside of a room with a blue background were favored as more creative. Uh, Zhu also theorized that red is indicative of, uh, sorry, indicative of danger, mistakes, and awareness, such as you know, blood, red lights, ambulances, emergency signs, things of that nature. So we tend to be more cautious and detail-oriented due to red making us feel more alert. Which I guess is, I mean, it's got to be blood, right? Like you see blood, you just think, oh, something bad's happening, so red, you you get heightened up. I don't know, there's something there. Temperature, hot versus cold. So most everyone engages in two types of mental processing. One's cognitive, where you take in information systematically uh, in a sequence and process the info as it comes, analyzing as you go to confirm a solution. The second time is aff affective processing, with an A, not an E, where you don't process all the information, but rather observe the information as a whole, and you use our experience and intuition to judge the decisions. Uh, we also call this our gut feeling. Uh, it really happens a lot in ear training classes. Typically, your gut feeling as long as you've studied, your gut feeling will be right. And then if you start analyzing what was that chord too much, you overanalyze and you get it wrong, basically. Or kind of like when you play marimba in a new hall and you have to adjust on the fly to resonance. Speaking of having to change, I know I've played on a few concert halls that I had not played on before the concert. And it was like, oh, crap, like you got to play slower. Like there's a lot of reverb in here. Uh, Zhu found that higher temperature activates your affective processing because heat depletes our mental and physical resources and causes us to make a quicker decision. To stick with the marimba analogy, on stage you have uh, heats from lights, tightness of dress clothes, especially collared shirts I feel like, and performance anxiety or arousal heightens us to this pseudo-fight-or-flight state and our body's temperature increases due to the release of adrenaline causing us to make decisions quickly. 
So in Zoo's research, she puts participants in front of four cars, and they had to pick which one was the overall best and safest for their family. There was only one correct answer. One group was explain the situation in a warmer room, high 70s, low 80s, and then asked to answer. A second group was kept in a cooler room, high 60s, low 70s, and asked to answer. The group in the warmer room was able to answer more accurately because there was a semi-threat state due to the higher temperature for them. The cooler room was far less accurate. Zoo went on to theorize, uh, sorry, Zoo went on with a similar experiment where participants were given detailed information on each car. The cooler room answered far more accurately than the warmer room because they made decisions based off of detail-oriented thinking rather than their gut feeling. Uh, as far as lighting goes, talking about dim versus bright, this is probably the part of the research that has had the most prolific effect, I guess, on the world. So this was actually referenced by GE to research their light bulbs uh, because the results were so uh, profound. Each group was given two point uh, sorry was given two print ads to a fake brand of camera, but not told what the ad was for. So in one ad, the images were very clearly related to cameras. It had a picture with a camera, a case, a zoom lens, a remote, and it was really a very uncreative ad. The other ad was far more abstract. It had a camera sitting on a hotel bed. There were some car keys and there was a globe kind of referencing travel and photography and travel. Zoo found that with a 100% success rate that people in a dimly lit room were able to decipher that both ads were for a camera. Uh, this logic is called disinhibition, which is where people in bright rooms associate the light with control and behavior like an office or a doctor's office. Whereas dark room is associated with relaxation, conversation, and creative thinking, like your bars, your coffee shops, your lounges. Uh, again, those in need of detail-oriented tasks will succeed in a brighter room, whereas a dim room inspires creativity and relaxes the mind. And this has been continued by several applications, such as Flux, uh, the Mac blue light filter, which takes the brighter light out of your screen and makes it way 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 better for your eyes and increases productivity brandon arve actually posted a thing about blue lights yesterday that uh i talked real shortly i just commented on but yeah if i have the blue light filter on my phone and computer and if you turn it off after using it for a few days you'll be like shocked by how how bad it feels on your eyes it's it's incredible um the physical space uh doesn't strangely enough doesn't partake to music as much zoo goes on to do a similar test involving clutter and physical space participants are asked to solve a puzzle in a cluttered room uh sorry participants that were asked to solve a puzzle in a cluttered room gave up over twice as quickly as those in an uncluttered room which shows that if there is no clutter then you are far more productive but at the same time i feel like creative workspaces are often very cluttered. Like an artist studio is very cluttered. My desk right now is a mess. Uh, there's drums and sticks all on the floor behind me. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced on the physical space one. Uh, that was also the, seems like the most briefly researched portion. But in conclusion, if you're doing detail oriented work, such as maybe music theory or things where you need to do uh, kind of true or false, right or wrong, black or white uh, analysis, a moderate amount of background noise, a red tinted background, cooler temperatures, brighter good lighting uh, will probably work better for you. And if you're doing creative work, you know, composition, um, even just practicing, and if you're out of the note learning process into the more creative side, trying to get some phrases down, make it interesting, uh, still a moderate amount of background noise is always good. I always listen to podcasts when I practice. It just helps helps keep me in the zone. Blue tinted backgrounds, a little warmer in temperature, dimmer lighting. Uh, yeah, that should help you out. Google actually uses all this information as well. Uh, they have fake background noises played through their speakers. So it sounds like there's more going on than there actually is, but it's actually just patent. They actually have it patented in 2012 as environmental background noise. So Google holds the patent to environmental background noise, which is weird. So they pump in fake noise through through their speakers to keep their uh, workers focused. It's kind of strange. They also use a variety of colors that make 
uh, that change as you walk through, lots of accents. Uh, however, all the executive offices and the meeting rooms are blue, where they're doing all the creative thinking. Their new San Francisco base is cooled via the ground, uh, which is kept at a cool 65 degrees, but because it doesn't use traditional AC cooling, it feels slightly warmer. So it's cool, but there's no draft from AC blowing, so you don't get the chills or anything like that. They also use LED, lamp, and natural lighting to keep a dim but not dark atmosphere, uh, using lots of natural lights, lots of big windows. And funny enough, they almost use entirely rounded furniture. The only things that are angled or sharp are bar tops, counters, things like that. But it's kind of interesting that all this this uh, professor in China did this big research project for her business school. And then Tim, Ga uh, Tim Galloway and John Gorey are writing these books. And then Google's doing this thing. And it's just like, okay, all these successful people are saying this thing's true. So it's seems like it's probably true. So what Google needs to do from here is send us $50,000. Google, if you're <laughs> listening, give us 50 grand. <clears throat> I was going to say, if they want more background noise and they're really interested in that very specific sound of a guy playing marimba poorly, I'm looking for work. Dude, I'm looking for work. Same here. Yeah, that's, oh man, that's really interesting. I've tried it. I don't. I can't say if it has or has not affected me. Um, but yeah, I've tried to do the same thing. I've tried to keep my. I changed my Sibelius background and that, and my desktop. They're blue tinted. Uh, I don't know. I have. I have the bigger iMac computer, so when I have like a Word document open, there's still like there's still blue in the background. You can see. So maybe it maybe it helps. Maybe it's all in my head. But even if it is, the placebo effect is is totally legitimate. It, it works. Thing. I only see red. I'm just constantly angry. Dude, I'm frustrated. Constantly, I'm constantly frustrated and angry as well. Over over nothing. It's like, has anybody seen this symbol? Dude, I don't. I don't know what are you talking about. Just go find it. I don't know where it is. Oh man. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. This was interesting. This was this was episode uh, number one with no guest. People don't like us anymore. We have three fans. I think we have three fans. We're probably down to one. Our mom's left. I don't even care anymore. Yeah, your mom's left. My mom left. It's probably just... If you're listening to this right now, just drop us a comment. Just be like... <laughs> <laughs> just say something stupid. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, cool. Well, yeah, this was interesting, man. Thanks to the people that answered on Facebook and Instagram that got way more. That wasn't all the answers either. I, I kind of selected a couple. Um, but yeah, that got way more attention than I thought it was going to get. Um, we should do more. Yeah, we need to do it. We need to do a mental health one before Stephanie pops in. Yeah, that'd be really smart. Oh, did you see? <laughs> I shared this on the, the Facebook page. The National Review, that's the, as in the National oh, National Review, uh, yeah. review, <laughs> review of Jaap Van Zweden's uh, conducting of the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> the most desolate, like, abysmal, like, review I've ever read. Oh, it's so bad. For years, the opening line says it all. For years, the maniacal self-absorption of music director Alan Gilbert allowed the New York Philharmonic to deteriorate into a sloppy shambles and become the worst of the world's best orchestras. This season, there is a new director, Dutch conductor and violinist Jaap van Zweden. Van Zweden gave his opening subscription series this weekend, and the transforma <laughs> transformation was obvious. Under his baton, the orchestra is no longer sloppy. Now it's merely unmusical. <laughs> like, oh my god. What a, what Dude, a, what a what's jerk. The back, what's the background of this critic? Oh, he's he's nothing. Like he has no, he has no background at all. He also he also wrote a um, well, he is the CEO of the tech startup, Ditach, Ditach, Didich, something like that. Yeah. Anyways, he's also written. Um, wow, he's actually written several music reviews. Um, Are any of them positive? <laughs> The this one seems so. The Mets Kazi Fantuti is almost ridiculously entertaining. It's gonna be I, bad. But to be fair, his one of his more recent art oh, sorry, 
2016, his first article was, Liberals want your car keys. Can computerized cars drive better than we can? That's right, everybody. I'm coming for your car keys. I, I'm always interested in like the music critics like backgrounds because it's it. I don't. I, I feel like to me like the like the most I'll ever see non musicians get involved with music is they're always music critics. And uh, I played with a local uh, regional orchestra once uh, for a full season, and I remember. It was in it was a, it was in it was in Texas in the East region, but like uh, I remember that towns, you, like for and this is you know if you can this is the granted that's New York City that's going to be a way bigger venue, but like this small East Texas towns like paper new, news uh, music critic was he's brutal he was brutal on a concert they decided not to play Beethoven Mozart Brahms. Tchaikovsky, like you know, none of the, the like the standard ones that like when they when you have to play to your donors, because uh, you know it's like when you when you own a furniture shop and you're donating to the local orchestra for like, you know, I don't know, like uh, whatever ad revenue that can bring you, and they're like, what do you want to hear? They're like, well, we like Beethoven because we know that name, and so this concert they did all new living composers, uh, which you know to hear an orchestra doing that is rare enough. Uh, for an entire concert, they didn't play a single one of the hits. It was all new music. And granted, as a performer in that concert, I was like, it's all right. Some of it was really cool. Some of it was really ambitious. And the other parts, I was just like, this is just not my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> the article blasted it as unrecognizable, unmusical nonsense. It was just like they, they related it to just screaming and uh, with no substance. And I was like, this is this is the rant of a person that has little to no musical knowledge because it was very it was very modern it was very out there for some of the pieces and I could tell half the audience was really uncomfortable with what they were hearing, but uh, I his uh, I would uh, go ahead. The same guy's most recent review is just a uh, I guess a few weeks. Oh yeah. Oh sorry. Oh, shit. It was yesterday. He really <laughs> said he says uh, he's talking about Carnegie's opening. And Michael Tilson Thomas conducting uh, Renee Fleming, uh, the soprano, and the other soprano, Audra McDonald. And he says, just praises it. The program is Cuban Overture, An American in Paris, and Summertime from Porgy and Bess. So yeah. good, good music, but very, very accessible music. Then he goes on to say, when did popularity become a strike against seriousness? Schubert performed his leader at parties, and Bach played the harpsichord at Zimmerman's Coffee House. How do we reach a point where music to win scholarly approval must be unpleasant and to an untrained ear unlistable? Eh. Whatever. I don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I like I like Jobs conducting when he was with Dallas. Yeah. I actually he was really great. liked what he did. And yeah, I, I loved his conducting. It was so good. And the yeah, the music was so good that they did. They did the concert he was so critical about, this guy. Uh, they opened with Ashley Fuhrer's new piece, Filament, uh, which is a really dark, exploratory work. It's really it's really interesting, um, but it's, it's really cool. If you, There's video online of a, a chunk of it you can check out. But if you want to read an actual good article, the New York Times praised the entire concert, saying... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Yacht Van Zweden, the uh, NY Phil's new music director, could have begun the season opening gala concert on Thursday with something festive and familiar. Instead, he seized the occasion to make a strong statement of artistic purpose. I just like, good. Yeah. But, yeah. It was weird because it says uh, Van Zweden's artistic daring as he introduced himself to New York was an encouraging sign of things to come. And this is the thing that I like. Uh, at a moment when the Philharmonic is facing declining subscriber base. Yeah, I mean, if you're just... Yeah, uh, I won't talk about that. Pressure to finalize a renovation plan for a new hall. And just last week that I heard about this is... Uh, the dismissal of two players for an unspecified misconduct, um, yeah. which who know, who knows what that is. Um, maybe maybe it's been spoken of, but uh, I haven't heard of it. But 
Yeah. There's been a couple of those pop up uh, orchestral big name orchestras, or I don't want to say big name orchestras, but orchestral players being, you know, you know, doing this or that that they're not supposed to be doing, um, and then yeah, getting called out for it. And it's just like, dude, good. You know how many people want your job? Like, right? It's just like so. It's like, God, what a what a bunch of asses. Yeah. That's fine. Try to. I'll try to stay. I'm trying to be less political on this podcast. It's not working. No, no. We'll Can't. never. <laughs> a bunch of jokers running the country. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> um, well, cool. Yeah. Uh, well, next time we'll be hanging with Stephanie. I think it's going to be super cool. Uh, yeah, she's uh, very good at what she does. And yeah, she'll be a, a treat to hang out with. Very different. I've never. Um, I don't think I've ever actually sat down and like spoken with a music therapist about music therapy and what all that entails and what goes she, into it. I, I think it's going to be a great episode. I think she's going to have a lot to say. The one thing I'm really, really looking forward to talking about Crossman Symbol Line. Oh, yeah, it's gone. She's Crossman's a symbol gone. player. That's right. Ready to hear it. Does she march Crossman? <clears throat> I, mean, I think so. I, I should know. Yeah, yeah. I feel bad. I'm know. sorry. We're sorry. We don't. Okay. We don't know. Uh, I, like I feel like that's true. Uh, well, Andrew Ling, our buddy Andrew, his wife uh, taught. Yeah, taught Crossman, right? Symbol line. Yeah, I think that's where. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. we're right. We're yeah. right. Yeah, that's uh, too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. I don't have enough information to to make a opinion on it. Um, so I, I just won't. But I will. That's I will true. learn more yeah. about it. Yeah, need to need to brush up on it. Well, cool. Thanks for thanks for hanging out, everybody. This was interesting. We'll we'll have to do another duo episode. No, 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 no. We gotta do we gotta do the video game episode first. Yeah. Yeah, it's gotta happen. Th- How many callers can you have in one Skype session? <sighs> I don't know if there's a limit. Can we make a can we can we make a podcast world record for the most nonsensical, stupid achievement? Let's get as many people as we can on one episode. Why not? You know what? Let's just let's just take them in droves. Like five will come in, then five they'll leave. Five more will call in. We'll just swap somebody out every ten minutes. Well, uh, oh, it could be like a game show. We'll just vote people in and out. We totally it'll be could. Like, it'll be like that subreddit though, the uh, the cat one, where everybody only says the word meow, and you can't no, figure cat. out why. No, cat. They say cat. Oh, yeah. You can't figure out why you get upvoted or downvoted for no reason. Yeah, if you don't say the word cat, if you say anything else, you get banned. <laughs> but it'll be random words that just say cat. 30, you know, 3,000 downvotes, and then the next one will be cat, and it's like 10,000 upvotes. <laughs> Makes no sense. Well, um, well, thanks for hanging with us. Um, sorry we don't have a guest, but I think it went pretty all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's going all right, sure. Cool. We'll, we'll catch y'all next time. Episode ten. Finally, hitting them double, hitting them double digits. Can't can't speak right now. I got too much ginger ale going.